Yeah, I'd like to see you try and record a video when it's 40 degrees outside in a closed room with no AC. Hey everyone, this is Nick and welcome to your weekly Linux and open source news video. Almost made impossible by today's unofficial sponsor, Heatwave. This week we have the first alpha for GNOME 43 and all its improvements. We have Google working on Fuchsia to run Linux and Android binaries, which is definitely a sign that they are going to replace Linux with Fuchsia when it's ready. And we have the first official easy to install and download build of the Unreal Engine for Linux. And we also have today's sponsor, which is giving you $100 free credit to get your own Linux or gaming server. Thanks to Linode for sponsoring this video. Linode is my favorite solution to run a Linux or gaming server. It's what I use to run my own Nextcloud instance and my own only office server. The interface is super easy to use. They are affordable, they have tons of documentation online, and they have one-click deployable servers for a ton of applications or games. For example, Focal Board. If you don't know about it, it's an open source alternative to tools like Trello, Asana, or Notion. It lets you create milestones, keep track of your nodes, have a bird's eye view of your projects, and it basically helps you get stuff done. And you can deploy your focal board server in one click from your Linode dashboard, something I should probably do to ensure that I keep delivering my videos on time. And to get you started, Linode is giving you $100 of free credit to get your own Linux server or gaming server running. To get access to that, just click the link in the description below. Fuchsia, the new Google operating system, looks like it's going to go further than just power a few smart home appliances. Google engineers are working on project Starnix, which seems to have the sole purpose of running Linux libraries and applications and Android apps natively on Fuchsia. For now, this new OS and its new Zircon kernel only run on a few Nest smart hubs, but Google seems to want to really use it everywhere, to the point that it could replace Linux as the underlying base for Android and Chrome OS. Of course, this is going to take a while, as they are going to have to go the wine route, basically, by translating all system calls to Linux into calls that Zircon can understand. So this probably means adding new features to Zircon that weren't necessarily planned, and writing compatibility layers for both Linux and Android binaries. I think it's pretty clear by now that Google would rather use something else than Linux on Android and Chrome OS. There would be absolutely no incentive for working on these translation layers and doing all that extra work if it wasn't to completely replace Linux as the underlying system. Rocky Linux 9 was officially released. This distribution is fully binary compatible with Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9 and is available right now. Highlights include GNOME 40 as the desktop environment with all the nice things this version brought a year ago, like redesigned workspaces, the ability to run software using a dedicated GPU on hybrid graphics devices, do not disturb mode, different refresh rates per displays, or fractional scaling. Rocky Linux also brings the latest runtimes and compilers, and updated versions of the developer toolchains like GCC, glibc, or binutils. Also important to note, the default OpenSSH configuration disables root user login with a password, needing SSH keys to login instead. Alma Linux 9, another distribution that's binary compatible with Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9, was also released a while ago and offers the same utilities and improvements. And if these distros look pretty much behind in terms of desktop experience and versioning, it's on purpose. They're meant for servers or enterprise workstations, so they're meant to be extremely stable, and so they'd rather stick on something that's old but very, very well tested. Google has released Chrome OS Flex for all computers, including Macs. Chrome OS Flex is basically just Chrome OS, but installable as a regular Linux distro on any computer. It doesn't have all the features of Chrome OS though. For example, it seems unable to run Android applications. Google supports more than 400 devices officially from a large variety of manufacturers, but there is nothing preventing you from installing it on unsupported hardware with all the potential issues you might have. The goal is mainly to get businesses and schools to use Chrome OS without having to buy new hardware and with added security compared to a regular Windows install. Chrome OS uses Gentoo as a base and can run Linux binaries, 
and we'll even get Steam compatibility with Proton support pretty soon. I guess it's a decent option if all you do during your day is done in a web browser and if you're really into the Google ecosystem. I'll probably give it a shot on a laptop and see how well it runs. The GNOME 43 Alpha has been released as a nice little kickoff to GUADEC, the annual GNOME conference that took place in Guadalajara, Mexico this year. Sorry for butchering that, the Spanish Jota is definitely not something I'm comfortable with. The new release, while obviously not stable yet, brings support for progressive web apps in GNOME software, new touch gestures to navigate inside of applications and in the shell, better flatpak support with permissions, and support for web extensions and web apps in GNOME Web. GNOME Calendar will also get a new sidebar to be more usable and gets the ability to zoom in the week view. GNOME will have support for composite emojis for all skin tones, VPN will be handled way better, Wayland gets more support, and more apps will use GTK4 and libadvita. The alpha can be tested using the GNOME OS image in a VM or compiling the snapshot yourself. The final release is expected on September 21st, and of course I'll have a dedicated video when it's out. I am very excited about this new release. While it might not be the biggest one in terms of changes to the apps or to the desktop itself, it shows that developers have really adopted libadvita and I can't wait to see what they've done with it. GNOME developers are also keeping up with updates and improvements on their core applications and libraries. And this week is a bit more interesting than the last. Files 43 now has a fully functional GTK4 based build which means that GNOME 43 should have a file manager that looks like the rest of the apps using libadvita. Developers notably fixed the drag and drop support in that new version. The sidebar is also now adaptive, which means it will hide itself when the window is too small and can be brought back by clicking on a button in the top left corner. A ton of apps got their about dialog ported to the new libadvita one, and a new version of GTK4 is out with a new text widget that responds to the UI layout multiple fixes for Wayland, and improved touchpad support on Windows. Gnome Builder also saw a ton of work using libadvita now, with a new tabbed editor, dark and light styles, a better project creation flow, and a lot more new shiny improvements to build your own Gnome apps. Citations, the Bibtex Bibliographies Manager is now part of Gnome Circle, there's a new version of Dialect, the translating app that uses libadvita, Loop, the new image viewer, has started work to follow the mockups created by Alan Day that I talked about in a previous news video, and Geary has a new maintainer. A very, very active week with a ton of work on underlying libraries and systems. And as I said, developers seem to be really jumping at the opportunity to use libadvita, which is really nice to see for a platform like that. KDE developers also have some stuff to share. One 15-minute bug has been solved, bringing the total down to 53. Dolphin, Gwenview, and Spectacle will now use the Portals interface for dragged and dropped files, which means that if you use these apps with Flatpak, you will now be actually able to drag and drop without giving the apps too many unwanted permissions. You can now set the default paper size when printing, and the About This System page now handles more hardware and firmware, including Apple M1 CPUs. You can now toggle the status bar for Dolphin from the Settings menu, a lot of Plasma widgets are now more accessible for users of screen readers. System Monitor now appears in searches related to tasks, managers, CPU or memory. The Show Desktop widget is renamed Peak at Desktop to be more understandable. And there were a lot of smaller improvements and bug fixes. And as always, you'll have to wait for Plasma 5.26 or the next KDE Gear compilation to benefit from all these improvements. Epic Games became a new member of the Open3D Foundation, supporting the Open3D Engine, which might seem weird as Epic Games also owns the Unreal Engine, which is a competitor. Epic joins AWS, Adobe, Huawei, Intel or Microsoft as a premier member that donates a relatively large sum of money to the project. The goal seems to further portability and interoperability of assets, scripts and more, to make sure that people can move from one engine to the next with relative ease. It also means that a VP of Epic will join the Open3D Foundation board, supposedly to share what Epic has learned and to help shape the direction of the Open3D Foundation. The Open3D engine is coming along nicely with its latest release dating from May and having a native Linux build. 
how much we can trust Epic to not influence the project in a very weird direction, we'll have to see. But as the VP that will be joining the board mentioned the metaverse immediately, I'm very skeptical. And speaking about 3D engines, Epic now finally has a proper build for Linux of their Unreal Engine. It was previously available, but you had to compile it yourself from source, which would have taken a long, long time, and it required a bunch of technical knowledge and dependency installations. Now you can just download the build directly, which weighs about 20 gigabytes, and it will take about 60 gigs once installed. They officially support Ubuntu 22.04, but people seem to be able to run it on Fedora 36 as well, so I would expect a lot of distros to be able to use it. You'll need to accept an end-user license agreement and have an Epic account to be able to download it. You will also need a pretty strong PC with recommended hardware including a quad-core CPU, 32 gigs of RAM and an Nvidia GTX 910 or higher with 8 gigabytes of VRAM or more. Now, it's still pretty nice to see as it removes one giant roadblock for potential users of the Unreal Engine on Linux. Having a normal downloadable build instead of spending hours and hours compiling a super large code base, it's probably a lot more practical. Bottles, the super easy app to install programs using Wine, has just changed the default runner they're using. Previously, they relied on Cafe, which was purely Wine based, and moved as Wine got updated. The issue here was that Wine was updated too often in the testing branch and this led to a lot of stuff breaking. Now Bottles will use Soda, which is based on Proton and adds in patches from TKG and Proton GE and it should make for a more stable and smooth install experience for all the game launchers Bottles support. They also added the ability to sandbox per bottle to make using Bottles more secure and there's a new UI for installers that looks a lot cleaner as well with a status bar that tells you what's happening as things are installed. Ubisoft Connect also now has an integration that will list all the games you've installed using that launcher directly in the Bottles app. Now, Bottles is a really, really fantastic application if you want to manage apps and games from various launchers like the Epic Game Stores, Origin from EA or Ubisoft Connect. I have a video about it on the channel, it should appear somewhere up there. Check it out if you want to know what Bottles is. Looks like other handheld PCs don't want to let SteamOS run around being the only option, as Aya Neo decided they also want their own operating system, called Aya Neo OS. It will be based on Linux as well, and will be available at a later date that hasn't been communicated yet. It looks like they have some good ideas though that go further than SteamOS, by integrating all games from various stores in a single interface and a single library, Something you can do on SteamOS, but requires a lot of manual work to add individual games to Steam and sort them. They'll be able to run native Linux games and Windows games with Proton, and they will also add emulation integrations, as well as adding a bunch of applications like Spotify, OBS, Firefox or Discord. I have a feeling that Linux is going to become the gaming OS, as in gaming OS for appliances, like gaming appliances, like handheld PCs. Or maybe it will push Microsoft to release a gaming-only edition of Windows that is specifically tailored and optimized for games, which Linux can be, but Windows really can't right now. And on to some Linux gaming news to conclude the video. First, the Steam Deck now has 4,000 games officially supported, including 2,140 playable, and 1867 verified. There are also 1600 unsupported titles that just won't run on the deck or won't provide an experience that is suited to the form factor. The latest additions include the LEGO Movie 2, Axiom Verge 2 or Stray. Valve also put up a warning on gaming on the Steam Deck during a heatwave, like what we got in Europe this past few days. They say the deck performs at its best in a range of ambient temperatures that go from 0 to 35 degrees Celsius, and the deck might throttle over that. Tesla also jumps in the Linux gaming bandwagon, integrating Steam on their car dashboards. Since this system runs Linux as a base, you can expect to have full Proton support and play a ton of games in your car while you wait for it to charge. If you want to do that, because why not? And of course, we have a new version of Wine, version 7.13, that has been released. This one updates the Gecko engine, used to render web content, 
it converted the USB driver to the PE executable format and improved theming again. 16 bugs were also fixed for The Witcher, Wireshark and multiple games using F-Audio or a specific DLL, namely MS VCR 120. Plenty of interesting developments this week, and who doesn't want to play games in their car, right? And who doesn't want a laptop or desktop that runs Linux out of the box? Because today's sponsor can help with that. Tuxedo is a company based in Germany, and they make laptops and desktops that do just that. They run with Linux out of the box. You can choose from a selection of really, really popular distros, or you can install your very own and ensure that the hardware is as compatible as can be. And if there are some few tweaks needed here and there, Tuxedo has PPAs and repos that let you install this configuration and just make sure that everything is perfect. They have a wide range of devices, from the smallest Ultrabox and NUX to the biggest gaming towers, gaming PCs, gaming laptops, workstations, whatever you want to do, they have a device that suits that purpose. And each device can be configured with a wide variety of CPU options, GPU options, RAM, SSDs, and you can even have your own graphics design engraved on the back of the laptop, for example, your company logo, like what I did on my Stellaris 15, which is a laptop from Tuxedo that I use every day to edit all my videos. It's a really, really nice device. So if you're in the market for a new computer and you want to ensure that it runs Linux really, really well, well, head over to the link in the description, click it and get yourself a Tuxedo device. They're really nice. Now, thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment, whatever it takes to make that video more popular. And if you didn't like it, well, you can also dislike it and write a comment because both of these actions will also make the video more popular. And if you really like what I'm doing on this channel, you can also join my Patreon subscribers or YouTube members and get access to a weekly podcast or the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. Or you can click the super thanks button or the PayPal link in the description and donate just one time. So thanks everyone for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye!